We always love coming here. I'm sorry it was such a short time together, but uh, twist your pastor's arm and try to convince him to have us back, all right? All right, you ready to get into the Word this this evening? Uh, Tonight, I want to um, start off with, to me, one of the coolest stories. It's the story of Queen Victoria talking to her prime minister. And uh, she asked a question. She says, can you give me one verse in the Bible that will prove its truth? And what he says in, to, in regard to that question is very, very powerful. He says, your majesty, I'll give you one word, Jew. He said, if there was nothing else to prove the truth of the Bible, the history of the Jews is sufficient. Now, there's packed, packed factual information that that's just mind-boggling. And I was talking to Carolyn. Carolyn loves all the the English uh, histories and all that stuff. And we were talking on the way over tonight about Queen Victoria. She was a, a very godly person. She loved the Jews. She loved Israel. She loved her Bible. Matter of fact, she says that book accounts for the supremacy of England. And, you know, there was a time that God had blessed England, and God said, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. Once Israel made some negative things against, or England made some negative decisions about uh, Israel, it's never quite recovered. But it was interesting, in her lifetime, she did some pretty extraordinary things. One of her... um, uh, commissions was to this guy called uh, Sir Charles Warren. And he was very famous. He, matter of fact, he was living during the time of the, um, oh my goodness, my brain just m- messed up here. Um, uh, the, the guy that killed a bunch of people never could find out who he was. Um, yeah, Jack the Ripper. He was, uh, he was an investigator during that time. Anyway, he was a, a, a police commissioner, um, an army officer, but as an archaeologist, he was, became very famous. Uh, he was commissioned by Queen Victoria to actually go to Israel and start trying to uncover something that was deeply embedded in her heart. When she went to, to Israel and she tasted the water and she said it was, it was smelly. And she said, I just can't imagine King David um, drinking out of that or Jesus drinking out of that. In down deep inside, she knew something wasn't quite right. Well, long story short, this is just how the Jews and all the stuff about them come out. They, she sent him to, England, or to Israel, and in his investigative skills, he uncovered some amazing things. And what, matter of fact, one of the uncoverings is named after it, called the Warren Shaft. And this is this area that led to the Gihon Springs, or Gihon Springs, where um, they have discovered and uncovered the city of David. What an, a, an absolutely astonishing discovery. And under this, they found all kinds of tunnels. And of course, history has changed as a result of Warren going there. And um, now you can go to Israel and actually get involved in some of those tours in the city of David. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But it was outside of the current walls that are associated with the Temple Mount. This is actually a photo back in the, uh, in the 30s um, showing the, uh, the south end of what is commonly called the Temple Mount. And um, it is quite interesting when you look at, for example, this aerial view flying over Jerusalem back during the 30s, and you can see how... how unimpressive it was at that point. This little tiny spot out in the middle of almost a a completely forsaken place. Now, you know by this time, almost, you know, 1900 years had passed of um, the overthrow of the Jews and uh, their disbursement around the world. But God had a promise. Now, here is a, a current photo 
over this same site. But I want you to look at this because what you see here is the most contested partial of a ground on the planet. This little tiny 35 acre spot has caused so much controversy. But I'm here tonight to say that all of this is going to change really soon. And it's not what you think, okay? If what I'm going to say tonight is true, everything, ladies and gentlemen, changes. Everything changes. As a matter of fact, I have to go back over and revamp my own system. You see? Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you tonight to be Bereans. Remember in the book of Acts, it says they were more noble than any other because the Bereans studied daily. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things are so. Now, I will just tell you, especially if you love Israel as much as I do, your first inclination is to cross your arms, shake your head no, and resist what I'm going to say. But if you'll hear me out, test this, don't automatically reject it, but be open-hearted, open-minded, and see if what I'm saying is not the truth. Now, before we get into that, let's go back just a couple months ago when we remember um, the Palestinians that had murdered these two Israeli policemen on the Temple Mount. And for the first time since 1967, when Jerusalem was recaptured, they shut down the Temple Mount. Do you all remember that? And, of course, during that time, they put up... Uh, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the metal detectors and the Muslims went insane. They just can't imagine you would do such thing, which, by the way, is totally hypocritical because uh, um, uh, uh, the Mecca, the, they do the same thing to Mecca. They've got it secured and they've got it protected and they have metal detectors. But all of a sudden, if the Jews try to do it, it's horrible. Well, needless to say, that all changed. It didn't take very long for the complaint to go. But during that time, during that little tiny few days, some remarkable things took place. Suddenly, ascetic Jews, these highly devoted Jewish people, ascended on top of the, quote, Temple Mount. Matter of fact, at one point, there were 1,300. This is a record-breaking number. Ascended up to the Temple Mount and... This, oddly enough, was on August the 1st, which is very significant because that just so happens to be a Jewish day known as the 9th of Av. And the 9th of Av takes us all the way back to Numbers 13 and 14, in which we discover when the spies return with a negative story, 10 of them said that there's no way we can go into this land of promise that God's promised us. We can't do it. And it sent just discouragement onto the people of Israel. And long story short, this date, God said, for the rest of the generations to come would be a day of crying and misfortune for Israel. And sure enough, folks... 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar devastated the original temple of Solomon on the 9th of Av, of all days. And that's kind of bizarre because 70 A.D., the second temple, the massive reconstruction of Herod's temple, was overthrown by the Romans and burned, just like the Babylonians did, of all days on the 9th of Av. Now, you will find, if you want an interesting study, just type in the 9th of Av on your Google search and study the incredible amount of times Israel, the Jews, met with horrible misfortune on the 9th of Av, the very day that they openly rebelled against God's word and didn't believe him, but returned with an evil report and discouragement. Now, the reason why this is important, because all the while this is all going on about the temple and it made up so much news, we missed the big story. And the big story was this astonishing discovery that took place just a few days before all this was occurring. It was, it was eclipsed 
by this, this riot and all the rest that was going on. And it was another discovery that absolutely proves that the Jews were in this location with their temple. They uncovered the Babylonian overthrow and the charred remains of, of jars and all kinds of wood and all types of evidence of a civilization marked, oddly enough, with seals that were noted for the kings during Israel's reign on these jars. And you can see one there on the far right. <clears throat> By the way, if you remember, it was Jeremiah and the prophets who repeatedly warn Israel that if they would not turn from their sin, that God was going to overthrow them. Matter of fact, Jeremiah explicitly made it clear that it would be Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians that would overthrow and burn their city and because of their sin of idolatry. Well, in this discovery, while this is all going on, about the ninth of Av, right before this is all happening, they discover some of the very idols that the Jews were incorporating into their pagan worship. And this is just another testimony of God's commitment to his people and his firm truth of, of his, both his blessings and his judgment on the children of Israel. And God said it would be for the all, all the world to sit back and notice how God works. Well, anyway... All that was said, tonight I want to talk about, because where they discover this, is what is called the city of David. Now this is so interesting because what I want to talk about tonight is probably one of the greatest archaeological blunders of all time. And it's going to be a slap in the face of almost all of us because we have a, we have a tradition and our tradition makes us overlook the facts. But see, here's the deal, folks. Archaeologists take a long time to end up proving what God said is true. And it may take them forever. It may take them another 40, 50, who knows how many years to document everything that the Bible says took place. I mean, they, they said there was no temple in Jerusalem, the, the archaeologists have proven them wrong. They said there was no King David, the archaeologists have proven them wrong. They said there was no Pilate, archaeologists have proven them wrong, and on and on and on and on. But I want to take you back to Matthew 15 before we get in. Is everybody with me so far? Yeah. Then came Jesus to the scribes and Pharisees, which were, were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he, talking about Jesus, answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your what? See, now folks, let me just say something. If it was true with the Jews back then, they are highly tradition-based people. You and I are too as Christians. Could it be that our tradition is doing exactly what Jesus said? We have made God's word, the commandments of God, of none effect by our traditions. We take our traditions over the authority of the scripture. Now, if it takes hundreds or thousands of years for archaeologists to prove God's word, then all of a sudden we change our tradition. Oh, well, I'm open to that. I just think we better accept God's word at face value no matter what happens. Now, I want you, with that in mind, to take a look. Because what you see right here is a piece of ground that is more dangerous than any spot on the planet. Matter of fact, some people truly believe that World War III is going to come as a result of this traditional temple platform. And the fact is, anybody that loves prophecy knows what kind of problem this is mounting for us. Because we believe that the temple is going to be rebuilt, but now we got this this thing in the way and we can't seem to get around it because the people that own this this 
this dome are much more resistant than anything you and I have ever encountered. They will die for what they believe. Matter of fact, they'll kill themselves to blow you up if you want to take what they believe. Now, how are you going to be able to deal with this? Well, what's interesting is some Jewish experts now believe that the Temple of Solomon and the Temple of Herod was never located on this spot in the first place. And that even though there are some very re strong religious traditions that has caused people to believe this, there's clear evidence that says this is not the case. And that's why I'm saying if what I'm saying to you is correct, this changes everything. Now, at this point, I've lost some of you. But I'm glad you're still sitting here. You just stick with me, okay? Now, I know you think I'm the abomination of desolation right now, but I'm not. So stick with me, okay? Now, let me just remind you that Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times. It's been recaptured 44 times. It's been besieged 23 times. It's been completely destroyed twice. And yet the city of David was founded over 3,000 years ago, making it one of the oldest cities in the world. Jerusalem, the city of peace. That's what it means. Now, let me do something now. Let's forget history. Let's forget archaeologists. Let's go back to somebody I think would be pretty reliable. Our Lord and Master, the Lord Jesus who was in the city of Jerusalem when he had made a statement. Matter of fact, he was at the temple site with his disciples looking at this phenomenal creation of Herod that had not even been completed at that point. It had been going on this construction for four decades. And as the, he's leaving the temple, the disciples are commenting about it, and Jesus makes a very astonishing statement. He said, see you not all these things? Verily, truly, I say unto you, there shall not be one here, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus say that? Did he say there would not be one stone upon another that would not be thrown down? Did he say that? Now, how many know if Jesus said that and you believe Jesus is true, do you believe that happened? Okay, well, just stick with me for a minute because we have some eyewitnesses who lived during this overthrow that took place in 70 AD. Three years later, one of the command, uh, a commander, he was uh, the last zealot commander that worked with, uh, at uh, Masada. Here's what this gentleman said. This is written in 73 AD, three years after the overthrow. Quote, and where is now that great city, the, metropoli uh, the uh, met metropolis of the Jewish nation, which was fortified by so many walls round about, which had so many fortresses and large towers to defend it, which could hardly contain the instruments prepared for war, which had so many ten thousands of men to fight for it? Where is this city that was believed to have God himself inhabiting therein? It is now demolished to the very foundations and have nothing but that monument of it preserved. I mean, the camp of those that had destroyed it would still dwell upon its ruins. That's eyewitness. Here is Josephus, who lived 37 AD to 100 AD, just shortly after the time of Christ. He was an eyewitness. He said and wrote of the entire destruction, the total destruction of the temple in 70 AD. He went on to write that if he had not personally been in Jerusalem during the war and witnessed 
the demolition of Titus of the temple that took place there, he wouldn't have believed it ever existed. He speaks of widespread destruction of all Jerusalem as well. Here's what he says in this in uh, Jewish Wars, volume <clears throat> two, and uh, I'm sorry, volume seven. He says, but for all the rest of the wall, it was so thoroughly laid even to the ground by those that dug it up to the foundation that there was left nothing to make those that came thither to believe it had ever been inhabited. This was the end which Jerusalem came to. Now that's an eyewitness. Now, do you recognize this place? Anybody like to take a wild guess? Thank you, Gary. It's the location of the Twin Towers. That's what it looked like 16 years ago. That is, was the largest building in the world. But how many know if somebody would have said, looking from the bottom, if you've ever been to New York and you look and you, I'm standing there and you're looking up, it's incredible. If, if you would have looked and if you, somebody would have said to me, John, not one stone is going to lie upon another. You got to understand the magnificence of this would be almost equal. I mean, maybe not quite as equal as the magnificence of the building structure of the temple. I mean, this was a historical mind boggling display. Somebody would say not one stone would lie upon another. You would say by looking at what it looks like now, there's no comparison. There's no resemblance. It doesn't look like anything like it looked at. But let's go back to Josephus for a second. Now, when Titus was coming to the upper city, he admired not only some other places of strength in it, but particularly those strong towers which the tyrants in their mad conduct had relinquished for when he saw their solid altitude and the largest of the several stones and the exactness of their joints as also how great their breadth and, and how ex extensive their length, he expressed himself after the manner following. And now he's quoting Titus the guy who overthrew Jerusalem. We now certainly had God on our, uh, for our assistant in this war, and it was no other than God who ejected the Jews out of these fortifications. For what could the hands of men for any machine do toward overthrowing these towers? He goes on to conclude, uh, Josephus, quote, he, talking about Titus, entirely demolished the rest of the city and overthrew its walls. Now, let me just ask you a question. Didn't Jesus say not one stone would lie upon another that would not be thrown down? Even though we have historians and eyewitnesses that account for that very thing. For example, another one was Eusebius of Caesarea. This guy was a curator of the library of Caesarea. He lived in the two to three hundreds. He was a renowned scholar and even today is highly respected. Here's what he wrote about this. The hill called Zion in Jerusalem, the building there, that is to say the temple, the holy of holies, the altar, and whatsoever was there dedicated to the glory of God have been utterly removed in fulfillment of the word. Now, he further notes that only a few lines later that sadly after the ruin of Zion, which by the way, Zion, Jerusalem, the city of David, it's all the same place. That the very stones of the temple, now listen to this, quote, the temple itself and from its ancient sanctuary were scavenged from the temple site in Zion and used for the construction of idol temples and of theaters for the populace. And as I mentioned last night, one of the temples that was built was the temple of Jupiter. Now, Jesus said it. Historians, eyewitnesses confirmed it. But we got a problem. 
Because what you see right here is the traditional view of the retaining wall of the temple. Matter of fact, you have to ask yourself, was Jesus wrong about the stones of the temple? Because there's 10,000 stones still lying one upon another in this region. So was Jesus wrong about the stones of the temple? Or folks, could it be that we and our traditions are what's wrong by thinking that the western wall is part of the original temple? Now I know some of you are almost ready to reach down and pick up a stone right now. Because you're thinking this man is a heretic. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Did Jesus say not one stone be lied upon, will lay upon another that would not be so thrown down? Can you see there's stones lying upon another here? So could this here be something other than the temple remains? Now, if you look at what they're looking at, they're seeing that mosque of Omar and you see there is that wall, that arrow points out. You see the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jews who come there daily praying for their Messiah at the Wailing Wall. Now, Jesus said that not one stone would lie upon another. But let me remind you, the Jewish faith does not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And therefore, they do not consider his word to be of any significance whatsoever. They, they actually detest him and reject him. Because their tradition has led them to a place where a veil has been covered over their minds and their hearts. And a Jewish man wrote these words. Paul himself, who so hated Christianity and what Jesus stood for, he made sure many of them were killed. And yet, after he had an encounter with Jesus, he writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, but their minds, referring to the Jews, his own people, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil taken away from the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Nevertheless, there's some hope in this, Paul says. When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. God says the veil is going to be removed, just like it was in Moses. And they're going to see clearly. But until then, their veil... This veil has covered their mind. They are not thinking right and it's covered their heart and their heart's not right. But they're still God's chosen people. And God made a covenant promise that will be fulfilled. And yet, Luke records that that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit. He's standing before a bunch of unbelieving Jewish scribes and Pharisees in their traditions, and he just rejoices. He has a praise service right in the middle of all of them, and he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from thee, the wise and prudent, and hath revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, so it seemeth good in thy sight. Now, I got news for you, folks. It was the rebellion of these chosen people of God that repeatedly had been warned by God to turn from their sin and submit themselves to God's laws and rules and his covenant. And they repeatedly compromised and turned their back on God time and time again that God sends severe judgment. And it was because of their unbelief and their disobedience that God scattered them over the world. And that's a sermon in and of itself. He said that he would regather them. And this has happened in our lifetime. 
We're seeing it come to pass. But it's going to come to a fruition in the great tribulation called the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble. It was during this overthrow, the Babylonian overthrow, they just uncovered the evidence once again, just two months ago. It was during this overthrow that the Jews lost their temple. They had lost their homeland, and they lost their identity. And obviously, over 2,600 years has passed, and all of a sudden, they're coming back in, in droves, and there's a spiritual awakening taking place in Israel. And this is a testimony, the Bible says, to the, all the world. This is the timepiece. This is the part that clicks the, the timepiece, the, the stopwatch into mode. And yet, while this is all happening, the Jews are still at this spot. And they're praying for their Messiah. They're praying for their Messiah. Their eyes are blinded. Their minds and hearts have a veil. But they're dedicated, devoted people. Precious, precious people. Now, obviously, John, if this isn't the temple, what in the world is this? Buckle your seatbelts, okay? Because this is going to be cool. I am jumping on the inside of me right now. Okay? Now, I want you to notice the, the shape. Just take notice of the shape. That'll be very important. Before I get to that, though, let's go back a little before the time of Christ, some 60 years before Christ. When the Romans moved into Jerusalem, how many know this is a historical fact? And General Pompey conquered Jerusalem, and this was part of the fulfillment of prophecy, as Daniel had mentioned, in the Iron Kingdom that would come. And, you know... Did we do the book of Daniel here ever? Okay. And if you all remember, we talked about the Iron Kingdom. Well, anyway, the Roman army ended up ruling Jerusalem for over 400 or, or nearly 400 years before they finally met their, their own demise. Well, the obvious question has to be, now everybody stick with me. This is very important. You, I get your undivided attention here. Where did this huge army house themselves? I mean, believe it or not, there's no archaeological evidence that has ever uncovered a Roman fortress. Where are they at? Where are they at? Now, with that in mind, I want you to remember we're talking the 10th Legion, the 6th thousand soldiers plus uh, uh, 4,000 support personnel to make this, this is 10,000 people, okay? Romans, not Jews, Romans that are leading this area. Now, I want you to notice, again, flying over this region of a distinct rectangular shape of what we call the Temple Mount, now, look at that and remember that image because what you see there is pretty undeniable. It has a very distinct shape. Now, why is that distinct shape important? No matter which angle you come from it, you can see there is a distinct shape there which just so happens to resemble the exact same rectangular shape of hundred of Roman fortresses throughout the Roman re, uh, 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 rule throughout their throughout their reign, you know this was a huge reign of the Roman Empire throughout Europe. You will uncover these exact same, and, and some of these uh, are small, and some of them are big, but they had a traditional image of what they would, how they would house themselves. And if you've ever been to a military base, you'll notice that some of our ways that we do things were constructed after the very order of 
the Romans. They set a precedent and a pattern that has been successful. And again, take a look at all these. And I, I'm not going to take a lot of time to get into them. I just want you to just keep your eyes on the screen and look at one after another. And the very same rectangular shape, the pattern shape, is very interesting. For example, when I went to Masada, you can take a, a, um, a cable car and you can come down and you see... Uh, out in the middle of nowhere, their their fortress, and it's that exact same shape. Now, obviously, these fortresses housed all these people, and so literally, they had bakeries, they had you know, they had uh, houses of prostitution, they had shopping places, they had about anything that you could have, and they were basically small cities. And keep in mind, these were Romans; these were not Jews. And, of course, their, their housing, their, their barracks, everything was within the walls of these things. And, of course, as you can see, all over the Roman world, you see these identical shaped um, uh, fortresses. Now, so where was the Roman fortress that was in Jerusalem that housed this 10th Roman legion? Now, I tell you what has been believed for a very long time, and that is uh, within or just outside of the walls of the temple is this little tiny spot that you see right there. It's called Antonia Fortress. Now, I want you to look at this because if you go to Israel, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Israel, one of the coolest places you go, and when I went there, it was our, almost our starting place, they take you to a model city. I mean, it's as big as this room. And uh, it it's literally covers this same, uh, and it's a model, scaled model of what Jerusalem looked like. It's, it's mind-boggling. It's so cool. But if you notice there in the upper right-hand corner is what they say is the now, this is all built from, not from actual eyewitnesses, but this is built from structures where they had kind of read stuff, and they believe that this is where the fortress of, of Antonia was at. It was located over there. But you have to ask yourself a question. Would mighty Rome, the prideful rulers uh, of that province, would be contented to locate their fort as an appendage to the temple? Or would they be more likely to seize an area where their regional headquarters would show their superiority over the Jews? you got to keep in mind, folks, these people hated Jews. Okay, They're not there to say, hey, can we kind of share some space? That's not how it works. And anybody that understands military understands you don't. Nobody tells you what to do. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at the current spot of what is called the Temple Mount, you have the exact same kind of dimensions that historically was referred to as Fort Antonio. Now, Fort Antonio, by the way, was this fortress that was a military garrison that was built by Herod in honor of Mark Anthony. And this was built around 30 years before Christ. And this artist's conception shows a completely different view. You see the temple to the left and Fort Antonia, where the Dome of the Rock is. Which, by the way, the rock, under the Dome of the Rock, is very interesting. It's not as the Bible says, where there was a flat land that was used as a threshing floor, but it's a very jagged, rugged, you know, uneven rock. I I was able to go inside the the, the mosque while they still would allow um, non-Muslims to go in. I got to be an eyewitness of it and see it myself. That's truly. Uh, a very important thing. It could be where Pilate had his prisoner, Jesus, brought to him. But this is not the Temple Mount. Now let's get back to Josephus for a second. 
he is speaking of Fort Antonia and of its height of the towers, and he says the inward parts had the largest in the form of a palace. It be in part on, uh, into all kinds of rooms and conveniences such as courts and places of bathing and broad spaces for camps insomuch that by all conveniences that cities wanted, it might seem to be composed of several cities. But by its magnificence, it seemed a palace. It contained almost four other distinct towers at its four corners, whereof the others were but 50 cubits high, whereas that which laid on the, now listen, southeast corner was 70 cubits high, that from thence the whole temple might be viewed. For this, we go up to this tower of Antonia, we gain the city. So what is, what is he talking about here? He said that this fortress had four corners, four towers, and the one on the southeast side was much higher because if you stood, which Herod would stand in that tower, he could look over the edge and look right down, eyewitnesses, and see the temple. Not on top of the temple mount, but below. The fact of the matter is, he said that it was 50 cubits high, that which laid upon the south east uh, corner was 70 cubits that from thence the whole temple might be viewed. Now we have an interesting thing here because what other location could there be that speaks as Josephus does of something being on top of a hill overlooking Jerusalem and that they would be able to house the legion of the Roman soldiers and that they would be able to look down on the temple. Where's this at? Now this is interesting, folks, because there's some people say, oh, well, we can explain that. When it says legion, it doesn't mean 6,000, it means 600. Okay, well, now you got a problem. Because if you're going to believe the Bible, that develops a problem. Because in Acts chapter 23, we read that when Paul was escorted, he was escorted by 470 Roman soldiers. Read it in 23:23. Now, if that's true, see if this makes sense to you. Why would, if there's only 600 soldiers, would, that, would the Roman soldier, would the Roman kingdom leave to themselves a hundred and 30 soldiers to watch over J Jerusalem, the troublemakers in their mind? The fact of the matter is, I believe that the Western Wall is not the remains of the temple retaining wall, but I believe it is still standing a testimony of what the Fort Antonio was. Now, obviously, it's still standing because it was owned by the Romans, and they're not going to destroy their own fort. But they devastated the Jewish temple. For if the temple laid as a fortress over the city, Antonia dominated the temple, and the occupants of that post were the guards of all time. He says that this area had two walkways. And the walkways would lead into the temple area. And it would be coming from the north toward the south. He goes on to describe that the siege of Jerusalem suggests that it was separated from the temple. And that these two colonnades, these two roads, these um, uh, pathways, separated the temple mount, what we call the temple mount, Fort Antonia, and the actual temple, which was in the city of David, by a 600-foot separation. Now, if you look at what they're now discovering, they found that the remains of this 
Oddly enough, it's not 590 feet, not 620 feet, but exactly 600 feet between these two structures. If this is true, and of all things, a two-level pathway that would lead down into Herod's temple. Now, Josephus tells us that Fort Antonia was built on a rock 25 meters above the temple mound platform. That's 82 feet. That Antonia Fortress was located where the dome of the rock is, and the very rock that the dome of the rock rests on perfectly harmonizes with Josephus being 25 meters high on which Fort Antonia was built. Now, you know what's so amazing about this? Everything that Josephus writes in history, everybody's, oh, that's so, yeah, that's so, the, the Jews accepted, except when it comes to this. It's like, oh, there's no way. You're telling us that's a fort? That's not the fort, that's our temple site. But everything else, they accept, they believe. Well, the fact of the matter is, if one would simply do your math and you would admit that the Temple Mount cannot be the true site of the temples that were built in Jerusalem. Is everybody still with me? Okay, I have to rush through this. I, I, there's so much stuff here. I, 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 uh, I, I'm sorry I have to go. But... Um, Here's how, here's how it looks. Here's an artist's rendition of what's actually going on here. That 35-acre housed the Antonia Fortress. And what is below that, according to Josephus, now as to the Tower of Antonia, it was situated at the corner of the two coordinates of the court of the temple, and that on the west and that on the north. Now I want you to look at this because this is quite interesting. When you see this, this pieces stuff together that didn't make sense in the Bible. In the book of Acts. Now, everybody, is everybody still with me? In the book of Acts, we have an account of when Saul, or I'm sorry, Paul came back to Jerusalem. He shaved his head. He was involved in one of the, the festivals. And it was during that time that they grabbed him and they tried to kill Paul. And he was warned about this weeks ahead of time, months ahead of time, that if he would go to Jerusalem, trouble would pursue. Well, oddly enough, he's rescued by the Romans. But let's read the account and keep in mind what we've learned so far. Acts 21. And all the city was moved... And the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. And forthwith the doors were shut. So Paul was at the temple. They took him out of the temple area, and they shut the doors. Okay? Now, watch what the next verse says. And as they were about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the land, I'm sorry, of the band, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Well, they're used to this. Every time they have a festival, every time they have a get-together, they fight. And so that's why Herod had to keep, well, what are they doing today? Oh, they're starting again. Come on down there and see if you can straighten it up. But notice what it says. Who immediately took soldiers and the centurions and did What? ran down unto them. Where were they at? At the temple doors. They had just taken Paul and they were going to kill him. And when they saw the chief captains and the soldiers, they left beating Paul. But it's not over yet. Watch what it goes on to say. And some cried one thing, some another among the multitudes. And when he could not know the certainty for the Tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. Now watch. So he's down in here. They take him. They run down to rescue him. They take him, and they're taking him up to the castle, the fortress. And he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came to the stairs, 
Well, there's your stairs. It's there right now as a witness. So it was that he was born of the soldiers, and you know the story. He has to be set down, and he preached the gospel. Now, this is quite interesting, because if this is true, and they were overseeing this, and they ran down to the temple to rescue him and took him up the stairs, something ain't right, folks, with tradition. The temple site, which is in reality is the Dome of the Rock, is actually the grounds of the Roman fortress, not the temple. Which now, if this is true, the implications of all this are enormous. This changes everything. Now, this is 1967. This is this wall. And you can see the Dome of the Rock, you can see their mosque. Right here, this area right here, 1967, was completely uncovered, or completely covered. Starting right here, and going on down, is what we call the City of David. Now, everything changes. Now, let me just stay, stay with me here, I got 15 minutes, how am I going to do this? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so 3,000 years ago, the city of David was only a little 12-acre partial ground. It only housed about 2,000 people. Here's what it looks like now, this little red area. You can see it compared. It's on the south end of what's called the Temple Mount. Okay, the city of David. Why is that important? Well, first of all, let's do something. Y'all been to Old Sac, obviously, and um, we usually, when we get to come to California, I like to try to take one day to go, and it's always fun. But 150 years ago, this is what Front Street looked like, okay, uh, from, viewed from L Street. Now, does that look anything like Sacramento does today? That's only 150 years. Now, watch this. So we're looking at the city of David from here. This is the city down. of David. Yeah. So we have the palace area over there. Anarina Heyman serves as the outreach coordinator for the city of David. Welcome to the city of David. It's the home to the ancient biblical Jerusalem. And up to 150 years ago, Jerusalem? everybody thought that the ancient biblical Jerusalem lies within the confines of the old city right behind you, within David. the walls there. So the question is, what happened 150 years ago? And where is the ancient biblical Jerusalem? She then helped answer that question by explaining how the city of David lay hidden for nearly 2,000 years until a British archaeologist began a discovery that continues to this day. Now listen, please. Chris, we're standing in a magical place right now. This is the place when Charles Warren came through the fissure that he found. He saw something. And when Charles Warren saw this, he knew that he rediscovered the ancient biblical Jerusalem. Was this the beginning, sort of, of the unveiling of the city of David in the modern time? Exactly, because now we're speaking of a 2,000-year period where nobody knew where the ancient city was. Most people thought when they, when they came that what they saw in the old city, that was ancient biblical Jerusalem. It's only when he found this that he discovered, but wait a minute, the ancient Jerusalem lies outside of what we call today the old mm. city. The discovery of this tunnel system known as Warren Shaft visually tells how King David captured the city and brings the Bible to life. When we saw this, we suddenly saw exactly how the picture came together. And many times when we do excavations, we also don't know what we're looking at. And then we have to go to the Bible and that starts explaining it. So it's the Bible and the excavations and the excavations of the Bible coming together, giving us the full picture of ancient Jerusalem. Further down, they found where men became kings. Most of the kings of Israel was anointed where we're standing right now. We are standing at the place of anointing. And Isaiah says, you will draw forth the water with joy from the springs of salvation. In fact, the city of David echoes with the people of the Bible. 
Abram when he met, met Melchizedek. But then we get to David, to Solomon. We get to Isaiah when he was giving his prophecies on these very walls here. Jeremiah afterwards when he had to speak about the destruction that was looming over uh, Jerusalem. All those things happening exactly where we're standing right now. More than 10 years ago, archaeologists uncovered another biblical site, the Pool of Siloam, that was fed by the nearby Gihon Spring. It's the place where Jesus healed the blind man, and also where the Jewish people would gather for the feasts of the Lord. Three times a year, all the men had to come to the mikveh in the pool, and from there, get ready to go to Temple Mount. And this is the walk, the final ascent, that all the pilgrims can do again when they come to Jerusalem. This is all underground. Haman sees this final ascent as a merger between archaeology and prophecy. Something amazing is happening, Chris, because we said that we are now excavating this road. And again, prophecy is being fulfilled because it says in Isaiah, build up, build up the road, the highway. And it says, remove the stones for my people's return. One ongoing excavation is this tunnel leading from the Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount. Haman says it reveals the past and opens a door to the future. One of the city of David's most ambitious projects is this excavation called the Givati, where the entire history of Jerusalem is being revealed as if the rocks are crying out. You can see exactly how she slowly disappeared from civilization because one city was built upon the other and you could see how the city could have lost hope thinking who's ever going to discover me again until God says but in a time of favor nothing can stop it and that's what we see in Kivati Jerusalem is slowly being revealed Haman sees prophecy unfolding we're starting to see in the last decade the blueprint she's starting to share what she looked like to us again so you can see how prophecy is speeding up as we go it says Hitna arime afar kumi. shake off your dust arise take your rightful place jerusalem if you see the excavations here on a daily basis you can see the buckets flying you can see the dust literally flying about how she is shaking off her dust she considers her role in the city of david a privilege I call myself the luckiest person in the world, the luckiest girl in the world, because I have the opportunity to take what we see here and tell the people about the city of David, about the ancient Jerusalem. And every person that is passionate about Jerusalem and serious about biblical prophecy needs to know this. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the city of David, Jerusalem. Folks. Now, do you understand how incredible this, this is all just happening? They, they accidentally came upon the Pool of Siloam. They were digging because a sewage pipe had busted back in 2004, and they were trying to do repair work. They, and any time they dig in Jerusalem, they have to have the Antiquities Committee to be there because they started digging. All of a sudden, they hit these rocks, and they said, stop everything, and they started digging, and they found the very Pool of Siloam being fed from the Gihon Springs which, ladies and gentlemen, this changes everything. Everybody's thinking Jerusalem is up on that hill. No. It's exactly where God said it would be. It would be in the city of David. A distinct mark difference. Now, in case you don't understand, all of these discoveries are being done by Jews. And all of a sudden they're going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And now they start digging more, and now they're getting so excited because they're saying, this changes everything. And this changes the most important part of this missing element. Now, let me just read to you 2 Samuel. I'm down to seven minutes. I got to brush this, so stay with me. Nevertheless, David took a stronghold of Zion. The same is the what? city of david now you can look at the site there you can see it from an aerial point up here at the top oops um uh, up here is the temple site this starting right here and all in doubt this is the city of david to give you an idea of what it looks like if you go to the city of david now they have a little video this is a portion of that video it gives you a 3d rendition of what it looks like 
what David would see. This is where David overthrew the Jebusites and took this city. It was in this city that he built his palace. And it was in this city that he started realizing we have to house the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And it was in this area, this very region, that he bought a field for Molnan, a threshing floor, a flat area, the Ophel, the, the Mount Moriah. And it was upon this very spot that Solomon, because David was not permitted, that Solomon constructed the original temple. Folks, two months ago, they uncovered the very spot of the temple, not in the Temple Mount, but in the city of David, where God said it was was it, it was at at the beginning. Now let me just tell you, David, if you remember, as he's dancing in joy and glee, when they were bringing in the Ark of the Covenant, the scripture made it very clear that David um, would not remove the Ark of the Lord into the city of David. If you remember the first part, they put on the, colt, the cart and uh, you know, a guy was killed when he was trying to, to hold it up. And I think pastor preached on this not too long ago. You all remember. So he carries it aside to the house of Odin Edom. And it, there it stays there for months until finally it says, The Lord hath blessed the house of Odin Edom and all the, that pertaineth unto him because the ark of God was there. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Odin Edom into the what? City of David. And he did this with joy, rejoicing. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. And the Ark of the Lord came into the what? City of David. And you know the story how Micah uh, is making fun of him and all the rest. And it said, and they brought up the Ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And it was there that David burnt an offering. So it's not on the Temple Mount, it's, on, it's in the city of David. Now, if you remember, it tells us in 2 Samuel that he buys this area. He, he purchases it so it would be an everlasting decree that he didn't get it and steal it or whatever. He buys it, this threshing floor, and it was there that the scripture says that this was a, uh, the, the spot that they would make this official transition. And so this is interesting. It says in Second Chronicles, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared for the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. And then the fact is, that's unquestionable where he built it at, and this was in the city of David. This is, this is not on the Temple Mount. And the city of David, as you see in this ancient picture, is south of the temple site. And even historians mention that the temple was not only in Zion, but located nearly in the very center of the city of David. These are secular historians they say that for the example the roman uh, historian tacitus recorded that the temple at jerusalem had a natural spring of water that welled from its interior described in the gihon springs and it's located close to what is referred to as the Ophel, which is the bulge on the earth uh, uh, abutting up to the city of David, which is called Mount Zion or Mount Moriah and all these things, laying just to the south and roughly a thousand feet from the temple site. I'm sorry, from the temple mount. There are no springs on the temple mount, quote, quote, temple mount. But the Bible says that a spring, which would be crucial part of worship, 
which is a, a mandatory thing. Matter of fact, Joel talks about a fountain shall come for, forth from the house of the Lord. And it's there in First Corinthians, or First Kings, it says that Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet went down. Now listen to this. Went down and caused Solomon to ride upon David's mule and brought him to Gihon. Gihon is not on the temple mount. Gihon is in the city of David. That's where Warren discovered the Warren this the, this uh, this shaft. This all started to come to peace. The, the place, and all of a sudden, Jews are going, "Oh my goodness, this changes everything." And by the way, while they're down there, the Gihon, they find the the place where they would crush the olives. They, that hole, they would take the 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 wood and they would grind it, the olives and have fresh olive oil to anoint and you see the little the area there that's cut out that was for the catching of the sacrifices of that were slaughtered and you can see on the sides of it I don't have time to show all the pictures but you see they have they have the where they would have the lambs goats would be tied they would slit their throat and that would um, uh, catch the blood now by the way this guy Han Springs is would be like um a gusher at uh, Yellowstone, except it's not hot. It's fresh, cool water, and it gushes. And it goes up 40 straight feet into the air, into the temple. Guess what? That's not on the temple mount. That's in the city of David. Ezekiel talks about it, even says that, Behold, the waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. The fact of the matter is, when you look, when you look at this, you find out this changes everything. I believe that the true side of the temple is south of the Temple Mount, the city of David on Mount Zion. I know I went so fast, and I'm sorry for that. But let me just tell you something real quick. If you ever go to Jerusalem, you're going to be disappointed in some stuff. For example, did you know there is two, two Mount Calvaries? On the left, you've got... The Catholic version on the right, you got the Protestant version. You got two Golgothas. Which one's which? You also have two resurrection areas, two garden tombs. On the left, you see the gaudy Catholic thing with all kinds of stuff built over it. And then, of course, you have uh, the Protestant one. Now, Folks, if there's two opinions among us where Jesus died and where Jesus resurrected, do you think there might be a possibility the Jews might have a couple opinions too? As the old saying, anybody that uh, knows Jews, uh, they're, they're, one of their favorite sayings is, if there's uh, two Jews, there's three opinions. <laughs> now, things, folks, and I'm... I'm taking two minutes because I got two minutes cut off. Where's the preacher man? He's back there? Okay. Um, things are speeding along. And God is going to be proven 100% accurate about Israel, the Jews, and about the future. And let me just tell you this. This is why this is all important. I will shut up. If it could be proven, and that's a big if. If it can be proven, and if it can be accepted... That the temple did not stand on Harim Ash uh, uh, Sharif, which is the Temple Mount, but that it actually is located southeast in the ancient city of David, where the Bible says it was, you know, some thousand feet south, it could possibly bring about some type of peace covenant between the Jews and the Arab world. Because all of a sudden, Arabs say, Oh, you're not going to try to take our temple? Or I mean our mosque? Oh, that's good. Maybe we can get along for a while. <laughs> the fact is, could the discovery of this give the Antichrist a leverage toward a peace deal and bring about some type of tranquility and peace and allow the Jews to finally build their temple in the original site that God said it would be? And I will tell you, according to Daniel 9, that he will confirm the covenant for one week, for a seven-year period of time, a week of years. But you all know how that ends. 
he's going to use it as leverage to blaspheme God. But guess what? According to the Bible, there's going to be a temple and they're going to have sacrifices. And as long as that mosque is the issue, it's going to be a long time. But now the Muslims are saying, hey, if that's where you want to build the temple, we would be willing to help you. And with that, I turn it back to pastor. Let me just say this. I like this phrase. I know this is not what Jesus was talking about, but let's see if we could apply this to the discoveries. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nothing hid that shall not be known. Maybe you and I will get to see this happen before our eyes. <laughs> I love you all. God bless you.